All right, so uh, we're going through the life of Elijah. And in doing so, obviously we've sped through 1 Kings and into 2 Kings because not every chapter deals with Elijah specifically. And in fact, we're coming to a close. I think we will do one more sermon after this on the life of Elijah where we'll talk about this uh, actually same chapter and how he goes up in a whirlwind and all that. So we had to read it today because I feel like Although we're not going to cover the entire life of Elisha, I feel like it's necessary in dealing with the life of Elijah to talk about Elisha. Uh, and so sometimes that na- you get those names mixed up. It's real easy. Elijah, of course, is the, the prophet, the main prophet we're talking about. Elisha would be his uh, kind of understudy, his helper, his, uh, uh, you know, the preacher boy that was going to come up after him. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the life of Elisha, and particularly the title of the message is uh, The Importance of an Elisha. The Importance of an Elisha. Now, I've uh, preached, I think, I'm sure, both in Iola and here on this subject. Uh, it comes up throughout Scripture. You think about uh, a lot of the men of God in the Bible had somebody who was a help and a minister to them and, and worked under them. You think about Paul, and he had Timothy, and he had Titus, and he had Silas, and he had all these people with him. Uh, Barnabas, of course, had his, uh, uh, you know, his uh, nephew, uh, um, uh, John Mark, and, uh, and you know, many, you know, we think about Abraham, and, and he had Lot. I don't know if that was a good thing, but, uh, you know, all these guys, they had somebody with them, somebody that would help them, somebody that would uh, minister unto them. So that's where we are in ta- and, and kind of departing, not necessarily departing from Elijah, but talking specifically about uh, the Elisha in his life. Okay, so let's start in 1 Kings 19, because this is where we first hear about Elisha. First Kings 19, we don't really know how old he was. I'm assuming he was fairly young. And, of course, he's living with his, his parents. He's strong enough to be w- doing a lot of work for him and, and all that. But let's start with First Kings uh, chapter 19, verse 16. It says, uh, And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat in Abimahola, uh, 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 shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And uh, it, can, it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. Him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha uh, slay. So if you remember uh, this story, when we were talking about... Uh, Elijah and now he's on the run from Jezebel and he's depressed and he's in the cave and and uh, the Lord uh, is is you know talking to him and he sends an angel to minister unto him and basically after just some time of sleeping and getting some rest and eating uh, you know food that the 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 angel brought to him and and uh, just getting a little bit of of rest there, he goes back and he says he's got a 40-day journey and he's got all this work to do. But one of the motivations that God gives him is that, hey, you have got a job to do. You've got a king to anoint and a prophet that's going to take your place who you've got to train. And, uh, and, and, and I remember just talking about that and studying that part of the story where I realized uh, how important it is when we get to the point where we're depressed or we feel like, man, I just got too much on my plate. I just, uh, you know, uh, this job is overwhelming for me or whatever. Sometimes it helps to be a little less selfish, although that's normal for us to think about ourselves, but to be a little less selfish and think about like, but how does God, you know, how, what does God want me to do to help other people? It's like the people that say, well, you know, I don't think you need to go to church. You can just stay home and worship God and read the Bible. And of course, we know that the Bible says, you know, forsake not the assembling yourselves together. Uh, But actually, there's another, you know, there's, there's, it's more than just, well, no, you need to come to church because it's going to help you grow or whatever. People need you. There might be something, you know, that God has you. Uh, something about about your personality, your character, something that you might say to somebody, somebody who's been watching you. 
they need you to be there because there's something that you can impart to them. And so sometimes that'll get us out of our mind of just saying, hey, it's overwhelming. I can't do this. It's too much. Whenever we think about, hey, there's other people I can invest in and it kind of gets our focus off ourselves and onto other people. And I feel like that's kind of what was happening here to Elijah. But one of the things he said is, hey, you got a guy that you're going to have to raise up and train and he's going to carry the uh, carry on the job that you've been called to. And I think particularly of pastors that I've known over the years. And, you know, sometimes pastors get up in age. Maybe they start having health problems or they're just, uh, you know, kind of losing their zeal for the ministry or something like that. And they just hold on to the last minute. And then they're like, I can't do it anymore. And they just kind of walk away. And I've been a lot of I've known a lot of churches that end up not having a pastor for a long period of time because this happens and they didn't ever have somebody that they trained up. They didn't have somebody to take their place. And so now the church just goes years and years and years, just, you know, searching for a pastor, waiting for somebody who can take the job. And many times churches will just end up going non-existent. You know, they'll close down or something like that because uh, those things weren't in order. But really that should be a big focus, I believe, of pastors is to raise somebody up and invest in someone else's life who, you know, or maybe multiple people that if they were to walk away, there would be, or if something, Lord willing, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, uh, Lord, uh, God forbid, something should happen to them, you know, they die in a car wreck or something like that. There are guys that can stand up, they know what to do, and they can take it over from, uh, from there. And so that's a good encouragement for anybody in the, any kind of a position, really. You should always be preparing for the future. You know, really, even in your family, if you think about it, like, I'm not saying you have to you know, buy a lot of life insurance or something like that. But, you know, hey, as a pastor, I've been part of a lot of funerals where once that person died, their family had no idea what to do. They had no money to bury the body. They had no uh, plans as to the future, no kind of insurance, nothing to take care of. I'm just saying it's good for us in our lives to be thinking, hey, I've got wife, kid. I got, <laughs> I started to say, I've got wives. So that's not... <laughs> We have wives, we have kids, we have people that we need to invest in and, 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 and get, you know, uh, make sure that if we pass away, the work, our work, whatever we have uh, left behind continues going. I think that's a responsible thing to do as a Christian. All right, so, uh, so we don't really know all the details, but if you remember even Elijah himself just kind of pops on the scene, you know, like all of a sudden the Bible starts talking about Elijah, we don't really know his background. Well, now it's kind of the same thing with Elisha. We know his family name and, and a little bit about that, but we really don't know where he comes from except for, the God, except for God told Elijah he's going to go and he's going to find this man, Elisha, and he's going to take him with him. So look at chapter 19, verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Saphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elisha passed by him, Elijah passed by him, and cast his mantle on him. Of course, that would have been a sign. Takes off his coat and puts it on him. It's a sign that, you know, this, you are going to be my, uh, my understudy, I guess. And so uh, I have no idea if Elisha knew who Elijah was. I'm assuming he did. You know, maybe this is something he had a feeling he's going to serve the Lord or, or whatever. Maybe it wasn't a huge surprise to him. But all I know is what, you're, what he's found doing is not sitting around saying, you know, well, I can't wait for the day that, uh, that the man of God comes and puts the mantle on me. No, what's he doing? He's out there working. He's working hard. Now, I, I don't, I've never plowed a field with oxen. <laughs> but do you know what a, a yoke of oxen is, right? So, so one yoke would be, you know, you got this ox and that ox, and they've got a piece of wood of some sort over their necks, uh, you know, so that they can work side by side. And you want to make sure that they're about the same size. Uh, you know, the Bible says that you wouldn't you wouldn't yoke up an ox with a with a uh, with a mule or something like that or or a donkey because uh, they they don't do the same amount of work, right? So you'd you'd match up an ox with an ox. You don't want to be unequally yoked, and those those oxen would work together and they'd get a lot of work done, all right? That's one yoke. He's got 12 yoke. I have no idea how he is working the field with 12 yoke of oxen. Maybe he's got people operating all those and he's, and he's over the people. I don't know, it doesn't say that. 
But it seems to me like this man is a man who's getting a lot done. You know, he's got 12 yoke of oxen, and he's on the 12th one, and the 12th yoke, and he's getting this field plowed, and he's doing the job. I suspect he's a guy who his parents, if he's living with his parents, you know, whoever he's working for here, they're going to miss him when he's gone. They don't necessarily want him to go because he's getting a lot done. He's efficient. You know, he's, he's a hard worker, and that's a, that's a huge deal to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, and having said that, just thinking about, and the whole message isn't about this particular thing, but thinking about a pastor who's going to pass on, you know, a, a work to another pastor or, or something like that. What I found in my life, just kind of looking around, and again, there's guys that went to Bible college and they sit around and it's like they're just waiting for their dream pastoral job and they're really not getting much done. Those guys aren't usually successful. The guys that are usually successful, the guys that are found working, being diligent, getting, getting their job done, and God's just going to translate that into, you know, another work whenever their time comes. And so this is the kind of man that Elisha seems to be. And Elijah, you know, just goes and basically claims them and says, God, you know, has, has, uh, has told me to anoint you. And whatever symbolism Elisha, whether he recognized it or not, I'm assuming he did. Elijah puts that mantle on him and says, all right, it's time to go. Now, if you keep on reading... Uh, look at verse 20. It says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will go with thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave them to the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. So apparently he says, look, before I go, you know, give me just a minute here. Let me go tell my parents goodbye, kiss them. Uh, you know, let's have a little feast, kind of a going away party. And, uh, and then I'll follow you. Now, I don't know if you would, if you thought about this or not, but, uh, that is, uh, that is something that you could compare to. I'm, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here, but Matthew 23, And I am getting a little bit ahead of myself, but, but let's just read this and then I'll explain it here in a minute. Matthew chapter 23, look at verse 10. All right, that's not even what I meant to do, so let's just hold on there for a minute. Okay. Um, Okay, what I was what I was getting at. We'll come back to Matthew twenty three. Don't don't get too far ahead of me. Okay, what I was getting at is when Jesus says, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, any man that ha you know put his head to the plow and turned back is not worth it being my disciple. You know, you remember he's trying to get some guys to follow him, and the one guy's like, "Let me go bury my father." Another one's, "Let me go." Uh, you know, and, and, and all these people are coming up with these excuses. And Jesus is like, you know, hey, let the dead bury the dead. He's like, you know, just, you need to just come follow me. And it sounds like he's being really harsh on them. Like he's not even giving them the opportunity to go back to their families or something. Like I don't know all the details on that. Uh, but I don't think Jesus was being, you know, heartless. And here Elijah, Elijah is like, oh, man, you're right. What am I doing? Go say bye to your parents. You know, I think that. I think what Jesus was dealing with was a matter of the heart. These people were looking for, you know, they had these excuses. They were prolonging. They weren't really ready to go do the work. They were holding on kind of like, you know, I preached this morning on James talking about the, the, uh, the man who is uh, unstable, you know, because he's, uh, he's like the wind, I mean, like the waves that the winds toss to and fro, double-minded. And we don't, you know, God wants people who are willing to just put their head uh, to the plow and to just go forward and just do what he called them to do. And it's not like Elisha wasn't willing to do that. It's just that he wanted to be not only compliant and not only follow God's will and be obedient to his, uh, his uh, master here, but, uh, but he also was a man that was honorable, cared about his family, cared about making sure you know, he's kind of the man, let's put it this way, he's the man that would put in the two weeks notice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not just be like, you know what, I quit, and just leave his boss just hanging and dry. Uh, he wanted to make sure he took care of things and, and you know, uh, said goodbye to everybody. And, and man, he even, uh, since he wasn't going to be using his, his yoke of oxen anymore, he went ahead and, 
and uh, boiled them up and fed them to everybody. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so uh, here is why it's important for everybody to have their Elisha. And of course, my mind keeps going back to, hey, here's the man of God, here's a, a minister. Now, El Elijah wasn't a pastor, right? We got to uh, you know, make a clarification. The office of a prophet was a unique office. And even the time of, uh, in the New Testament, the time of Paul, there was still that office of a prophet who was receiving the word of the Lord, right? Now, we don't really have that office. We don't need it anymore because the prophets have already, their words that God spoke to have already been written down. We have the complete word of God. So there's no new prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy, which is the Bible. We don't need extra revelations, okay? Uh, but during that time, there was an office of the pat, uh, not the pastor, the office of the prophet. He oftentimes in that those days worked close to the king because the king was the guy that God had uh, anointed and, and put over that job to rule over his people. And then the prophet would hear from God, and it was up to the kings to seek the Lord by going to the prophet. Wouldn't it be pretty cool today if our, if we maybe in the United States we had. You know, uh, and, the, and you know, our presidents actually do supposedly have spiritual counselors that they can go to. But how many think they really have a man of God, <laughs> you know, like an Elijah that they're like, hey, Elijah, tell me what I need to do. Right. It would be kind of like Micaiah, you know, their response to Micaiah and Elijah and real men of God was like, I hate that guy. He never prophesies good concerning me and he doesn't want anything to do with <laughs> with them. But they like to surround themselves with these false prophets who will lift them up and tell them what they want to hear and tickle their ears. And, and, uh, and that's usually how, how it happens. Uh, and this is why here's Elijah, right? The prophet to these, uh, these kings of Israel, the Northern kingdom, every king in the Northern kingdom was bad. <laughs> every king, when it divided up and you had the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom, everybody in the Northern kingdom was bad. The Southern kingdom of Judah had some good kings and some bad kings. I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, tonight because I'm doing a series, uh, starting a series on, Ho on the book of Hosea, uh, which I will actually be talking about on Thursday. I'll be talking about uh, Gomer, which is an interesting character in the Bible. Uh, but the uh, uh, just the idea there about how God uses his prophets in relationship to, uh, to the kings is pretty interesting. All right, but here is uh, what a man of God, in this case a prophet, this is what, why it's so important and significant that he has an Elisha. Okay, here are, th here are four reasons. Number one, an Elisha is someone who ministers to him. Okay, someone who ministers to him. Look back at 2 Kings 2. 2 Kings 2. Uh, let me see here. First Kings 19. First Kings 19. Look at verse. Uh, man, I lost my spot here. What was it? First Kings 19. Verse 21. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew him and boiled the flesh with the instrument of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. And he arose and he went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Okay, so his job became ministering to Elijah. Elijah. Now, that seems kind of self-serving for Elijah, right? Hey, I got this guy who's going to minister to me. He's going to take care of all my needs and all that stuff. But that's not really that's not really how it works. It's not just this guy who's getting all the praise and glory and and he doesn't work hard. He doesn't do anything for the Lord. He just, you know, these people just give him everything he wants. I mean, that's what a false prophet would probably want, that kind of attention. But that's not the case. Uh, the case is, you know, a man of God needs somebody to minister to him. He needs somebody to help him out. Otherwise, he's not going to make it on his own. That's just how it goes. Now, thankfully, a uh, pastor, a pastor has a, a huge benefit in that it's a requirement for a pastor to, to be the husband of one wife. And a huge benefit in a pastor's life is his wife. I can't imagine uh, 
uh, uh, you know, I've often heard the question because <clears throat> some people want to stretch that and say, well, does it really mean the husband of one wife? Uh, or is it like one wife at a time, <laughs> you know, or is it me? And they throw all these things. Out. Does it mean if you're, if you're single, that's fine, but you're a, you're a one woman man. I mean, there's all these weird interpretations and it's usually like go back to the Greek and let's try to stretch this thing out and figure, you know, but I just take it really literal. The Bible says a husband of one wife, that you didn't be the husband of one wife. If you're divorced, you're not qualified. Doesn't mean you can't serve the Lord, but you're not qualified. If you're single, haven't been married yet, you're not going to be a pastor. If you're a woman, you're not going to be a pastor. <laughs> you know, you're not married. You're not the husband of one wife. And so I take it very literally, literal. And uh, and I think that whenever we read those qualifications in First Timothy, that we understand that uh, there, there, there's, there's a huge benefit to a pastor having a wife. All right. One huge benefit in my life is I don't know how to minister to women. <laughs> right? When a woman wants advice, I'm like, hey, go to my wife. You know, I'm not saying every pastor has that ability. You know, it's not up to the wife. The wife's not like I said, it's not like she's a second pastor or she's like the pastor to women necessarily. There's one pastor. His, his wife is a help to him, just like any other husband that has a wife. And in this case, since he is in the ministry, he's a pastor. Uh, he does need his wife to be able to take care of some things. You know, you, you think I'm bad about not always being on time and not being punctual and all that stuff. You want to know how bad it would be if I didn't have a wife? <laughs> I'd still be driving around looking for the place. <laughs> my wife keeps me in line, keeps me, uh, keeps my directions, uh, uh, you know, keeps me on the, on the right track, make sure I don't wear anything that's too, uh, too mismatched, although sometimes I do anyway just to make her mad. <laughs> but, you know, we need men, uh, wives who are helps to us. Now, you know, not every man's going to have a wife, and that's fine. Uh, but if a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, right? And for a pastor to have a wife, huge benefit. Now, I've often said this because the question has been asked, well, what if your wife passes away? You know, are you disqualified then? My answer has always been, it's not a matter at that point of being qualified or disqualified. If my wife passes away, I wouldn't want to be a pastor anymore. <laughs> it's not a hard thing to just say, you know what, we'll find someone else to be the pastor. I'll serve God as a single man or, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I can't imagine taking on that responsibility without a wife. So, uh, so that's a huge benefit. Now, another thing the Bible talks about is the office of a deacon. All right, we won't go into great detail about that, but I believe that a deacon, now deacons have a bad name because, you know, if you've grown up among Baptists at all, whether it's independent, Southern Baptist, anything like that, even Methodist or, you know, you name it. If you have gone to uh, the majority of churches today, they have abused what they call the office of the deacon. Okay, And what the office of a deacon usually is in a lot of these churches is just a council of men who are basically usually like the wealthiest men or the most influential in the community or something like that. And they're just on this like panel and their job is to make sure the pastor does everything he's supposed to do, and he's not paid too much, and he's not getting away with anything he's not supposed to get away with, and they feel like that is the, the office of the deacon, which you find nowhere in the Bible. That's really not what a deacon is, okay? The, uh, the word deacon literally means like servant, or, or not in the sense of like a, I mean, just depending on how you want to define that, but servant meaning like a helper, you know? And, uh, and so their job is to help the, the pastor, they're kind of like a second pastor or an assistant pastor, and they help, and they've got the same qualifications, husband and one wife, you know, wife's in subjection, children in subjection, uh, and, and, and down, down the line. And so, the, again, somebody who a pastor really needs, you know, a, a, an assistant, uh, you know, it, it, it does help, like I said, to have a wife. It helps to have kids that I can just be like, hey, go do this, go do that. <laughs> you know, it, it does get more job done. Uh, but to have a guy who is that assistant and that deacon is a huge help. I was telling people, and uh, man, I don't, I don't remember who I was talking to, but, oh, I know, my air condition guy. He's, uh, he's I don't know, I don't honestly know if he's in the ministry or if he just has just gone to church like most of his life or whatever. But anyway, we talk a lot. He's Calvinist, so I give him a hard time. But, but he, uh, he, we, we talk about church and everything. And, uh, and somehow we were talking about, 
I mean, I, I got to thinking about my uh, the guy I was talking about, and I forget where I was going with this. <laughs> okay, let's see here. We were talking about talking about deacons, talking about. Oh, okay, I know. So he, we were talking about how we started this work here too, and uh, and he's like, man, you know, how can you be everywhere? And what if you can't make it someplace? And and you know, what do you do as far as getting uh, somebody to be a preacher? And I said, man, I've got some guys there, and I that could at any moment preach, whether in Kansas City or they could drive up to Iola and preach if I asked them to. I said, uh, I said, the Lord's really blessed us in that way. You can't understand how important that is as a pastor to know you can just call somebody up and say, hey, would you be able to preach on such and such a day? I'm not going to be here. And you know that they're going to get up, they're going to handle the Word of God well, they're going to feed the sheep, they're going to take care of that. It's a huge load off. A lot of preachers don't have that. A lot of preachers, man, they couldn't trust anybody to get up there and preach uh, preach for them. Uh, but praise the Lord, I, I can do that. And, I, and I'm telling you, that is a huge, huge blessing to have somebody who can help to be a minister. Now, what exactly did Elisha do to minister to Elijah? We don't really see, you know, a, a clear uh, like job description, you know, it's not like we don't, we can't really see his resume and, and see what all he did, but we can see a few things. Look at second Kings three. Now this is, we're not going to go that far in second Kings because we're done with the life of Elijah, but we'll skip ahead and look at this just to see what happens after Elijah is gone. <clears throat> we see something similar to the case of, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, Jehoshaphat is asking Ahab, hey, is there anybody else that we could get, you know, uh, any other prophet we could we could seek counsel of God, we can inquire upon the Lord? Uh, we see something similar to that. 2 Kings 3, verse 11 says, uh, But Jehoshaphat said, different king though, he's not talking to Ahab, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now, I don't know if there were some ceremonial type things uh, that happened. If you remember when Jesus uh, turns the water into wine, there are some vessels that are there for the purification. And so you could read a lot of things about, you know, perhaps there was some ritualistic stuff, but I don't think so. I think basically here's what it means. When Elijah needed to wash his hands, he didn't. He couldn't just go into the to the closest uh, gas station, you know, and just turn on the faucet and wash his hands. So he would have Elisha just pour the water over him while he washes his hands. I think that's a, a simple task like that. And this is what he was known for. He's like, hey, who's Elisha? Oh, you know, here's the guy here that used to pour water on Elijah's hands, right? Just a simple thing like that was, was a description of how he ministered to Elijah. <clears throat> the Bible talks about, you know, giving a drink. If you give a drink to one of these, uh, you know, you've given it unto the Lord, whatever. Uh, and I always think about that whenever I get up to the, uh, to the pulpit and, and like my son or, or somebody, I think you're the only one that does it, uh, will have a water there for me. And I'm just thinking, ah, oh, that was a blessing. He got me I have to walk over there and get a water. Just simple, simple little things uh, like that. And I'm not at, don't misunderstand this message. I'm not asking people to, to be my minister. I'm just saying these are the types of things that Elijah did uh, that was a blessing to, uh, to his, uh, his uh, uh, teacher. All right, he ministered to him, poured water on him. You know, he, he ran errands for him. He, he, you know, was probably able to look out and tell him whenever somebody was coming, you know, and, and, uh, and do all these kinds of things. Now, here's the thing, and uh, here's where I started to get ahead of myself. Go back. You, you may have already, uh, you might have kept your place there or maybe you lost it. I don't know. Go back to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, look at verse 10. I just looked down and grabbed the wrong scripture. Sorry about that. But here uh, is what I want to show that it's not like it's not like an Elijah or a man of God or you know, whatever a pastor or, or a prophet, whatever. It's not like they are just like, you know, 
they just sit on their throne and they're just like ministered every every need, you know, by the by the uh, laity. You know, you got the clergy and the laity, you know, that's ridiculous. Okay, the biblical way is that a man of God was actually a servant. You look at someone like David, you look at an Elijah, or all these people in the Bible, Moses. You know, they were actually servants as well. But it just so happened they had people that were helping them to do their job and they were ministering to them. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. Uh, the, in Matthew, Jesus says this. He says, neither be ye called masters. Okay, uh, so what does he say? Verse 9, call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. All right, so he's saying, look, don't go around trying to get the title of father. Hmm, who could that apply to? You know, we have people today in the ministry, so to speak, that are called fathers, right? The priests, right? We're not supposed to call anybody father. He says there's one father, in, in, uh, and that's your father in heaven. We go around calling them names like, you know, master. He said, well, they don't call them master. Well, master of divinity, right? Uh, they've got their doctorate degree. they got their PhD. they got their, and everyone wants to call them doctor. Like the Bible says, just don't worry about those kind of titles. Don't try to, you know, just like, oh, you're honorable, you know, <laughs> your, your holiness. Which, by the way, the Catholics have way more than just father. They call them all kinds of weird things. And we don't, we don't want to give any man that kind of uh, credibility. So we're not talking about somebody who is just, you know, the almighty and everybody worship this person. That's, if you get into a situation like that, where the man of God is like wanting to be worshipped and everything that you know, you have to do everything that he says to do or whatever. You know, you've gone way too far. But it is interesting that now this Jesus's words. So I'm going to go off what Jesus says. Okay, but in the Old Testament, we see in this case particularly that Elisha calls Elijah both master. And whenever he goes up in a whirlwind, he says, Father, Father. Right? So he's calling them both those things. You know, it doesn't mean it was right, you know, and it, maybe there's some other things that I'm not thinking through. But I'm just going to I'm just going to go by the New Testament, Jesus words when he said, don't call any man father. All right. But in, in this case, it would appear like when you're reading these things, like Elijah had a little bit too much, you know, uh, uh, you know, like this man worship mentality, but I don't see that being the case. I believe he was a servant of God and he served other people and he wanted to help, but, uh, but he also had somebody, an Elisha, who would minister to him. All right, number two, why it's important to have an Elisha to have somebody to complete jobs that you can't finish. Now, that's a little humbling, actually, for a guy to say, like, I can't, I couldn't finish the job, or I'm not smart enough, I don't know how to do this, and somebody else then can cover where your failures were, or where you didn't, you didn't cover. That's an important job, and that's something that Elisha, now, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching this a little bit, but look at 1 Kings 19 again. 1 Kings 19, I thought about that when I read this. 1 Kings 19, verse 17. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And, uh, and so it, 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 here's what I thought about. You know, I know Elijah's not really mentioned there, but here's what I thought about. Like, anybody ever played, I mean, any, any sport, you play soccer or something like that, it's all going to, basketball, it's all going to, this is going to fit any of those areas. But I think about baseball because that was a sport that I liked the most. Anybody play baseball or pretty familiar with, with how baseball works and everything? All right, so I, I wanted to be a pitcher. Okay, that was like my, my favorite thing to do whenever I played. You know, or sometimes I would play second base or shortstop. Those were like my main, my main things. And one thing I loved about how baseball worked, okay, is like somebody hits the ball out into center field, you know, and you got somebody who's going to round first base. So the, so the, depending on what side of the field is on, the second baseman might go out there to be the cutoff man, right? So now that guy, he doesn't have to throw as far. He's going to throw it to him. But the problem is the second baseman has now left his base. So when that guy rounds around first base and he's heading to second, who's there? Come on, if you played bad. 
the shortstop, right? His job is to go over and take that place. Now, let's say hits the cutoff man, second baseman gets the ball, throws it to the shortstop, but the shortstop misses the ball. It happens. It's short hop, you know, and he misses it, doesn't go into his glove, and it goes behind him. Is that guy automatically going to be safe going to second? Not if everyone's playing their position, because what's supposed to happen is the pitcher, for instance, depending on how the you know coach sets it up, but the pitcher is supposed to go back up that shortstop. So if he misses the ball, he's got it. He can throw it back over there and get the guy out. It goes even farther than that. The third baseman, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the third baseman that will back up that shortstop. And then just in case, that pitcher will go over there and back up the shot. I mean, everybody's got like a backup plan, right? Well, if this man can't do it, then he'll do it. If he can't do it, then he'll do it. If he can't do it, this is why it's important to play your position and to know when you can step out of your position and be the backup for somebody else. And that's one of the things I loved about baseball, even though you might think, Boy, I don't know. I bet you a pastor got kind of confused out there on the baseball field. It, it happened a time or two. <laughs> but I do like the principle. I like how it works. And, uh, and I thought it was really cool to always be, it's just teamwork, you know. And that's what I think about whenever it comes to in Elisha, who, you know, a lot of times a, uh, you know, a pastor or whatever the case, of course, I'm going to keep going back to pastor. So a pastor, you know, there's certain things that he just wasn't able to get, you know, believe it or not, it's humbling because a lot of times the guy just wants to be able to do everything. Uh, but there's a lot of things I can't do. <laughs> and I've long admitted that and just been fine with that. But when something comes my way and I'm like, I don't know what to do, how to do that. Somebody else can take that spot and everything where everyone's playing their position and also backing up other positions. And man, when that happens, the work can get done and there's going to be less problems and, uh, and, and everything's going to go smoothly. This is one of the benefits of having an Elisha. Again, it takes some humility, you know, on the part of the, of the, it shouldn't really be like, it shouldn't really be humiliating, but that's just kind of the nature to just back up and say, look, you know, I, I can't do it. I remember, uh, you know, we started have we, we once a quarter in Iola, we have business meetings. OK, it's just traditionally what we've always done. And I've tried to keep that. And so once a quarter, I just kind of give a financial statement where we are financially, kind of what we've got accomplished and what I plan on accomplishing for the next quarter. And it's just a good way to kind of keep my head, you know, organized and what we got going on and just kind of let everybody be on the same page. The problem is it's kind of like living in a glass house. You know, you got to get up in front of everybody and tell them where you've fallen short and what you haven't gotten accomplished and where you, and thankfully we always have good, pretty good news to report. But what I notice is there's certain things around the church that you know, I wasn't getting done that I kept saying we need to get done and I'm going to get my kids out there to help me and, and uh, get anybody I can to, uh, to do some things around the property and to get certain things. Done. And I realized they weren't getting done. This business meeting, uh, you know, hey, I didn't get this done. We're going to put this on the next quarter's agenda. Next quarter comes, didn't get it done. I'm going to put it on the next. And finally, I said, you know, what I'm going to have to do is we're just going to have to start having some work days and people are just going to have to step up, try to get some of these things done. And we've only done it one time and not a lot of people showed up, but I'm telling you, number one, because some people showed up, there was some painting and some different things that were done. I delegated some, uh, the task of we're fixing, uh, uh, some cracks in the, in the, like we got here too, but, uh, but there, I mean, that's a hundred percent our responsibility because we own the property. We got cracks, you know, that are getting wider and wider and grass is growing up through them. And I'm like, I don't have time to do it. And so I got uh, Brother Jeff, right? He stepped up to help and, and he was in need of doing something because he couldn't work at the time and everything. So I said, hey man, this would be a perfect thing for me to delegate. And so this guy went through the whole parking lot, if you've ever been to Iola, and behind the, the fellowship hall there and then across from the main building, this big parking lot, lots of cracks. 
lots of cracks. And what we have to do is dig out all those cracks, and the best tool to use was a screwdriver. So he went through the whole parking lot with a screwdriver, just pulling <laughs> up those weeds. And then we sweep that and blow it off. Braden was helping out too. And we blow all that, sweep it up, get all the dirt out of there. Then we take gravel and we put gravel in there. And then we got to take uh, uh, some kind of tar. I don't remember what it's called, some seal, uh, sealant or some sort, and squirt that in there. And that's why you see the black tar all over the cracks, okay? It needed to be done, but I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. We've had it for like two years. And then finally, I just said, you know what? I'm just going to have to get some other people involved. I don't have time to go out there and do it. Uh, and, and man, it, it got done. <laughs> the painting got done. And so uh, I'm not trying to, I didn't set this message up to be a plug for Workday, but it is true. Like there's some things that need to be done around here. Brother Austin bears a lot of that as far as the mowing and all that kind of stuff. He volunteered to do that. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And, uh, and, uh, but this gives us an opportunity to say, you know what? Let's catch some of those things, you know, the pastor couldn't get or the uh, brother Oz couldn't get, brother David couldn't get, and let's get those things done, you know, uh, and so appreciate the huge list over there. Lots of things that we can get done. It's going to help out uh, the building. And some of these things, by the way, uh, will be, you know, we'll just deduct that all from our rent. So that's a blessing as well. Okay, so uh, uh, this is... The importance of having Elisha, somebody to complete jobs that you can't finish. Number three, I'll make the last two points pretty short. Number three, the importance of having Elisha is someone to defend and protect you. Boy, that's important. You know, I've talked about that not long ago. I preached on, uh, uh, let's see, having a sheepdog. Remember how I preached about sheepdogs? Okay, so, you know, you got your sheep, you got your shepherd, but sometimes you need a sheepdog, right? And I heard a great message from Larry Brown a long time ago called uh, Blowing the Whistle on the Wolves. You probably can find it online if you look for it. And uh, it's a good message. And, and what he was talking about in that is how uh, a part of the message he was talking about was how every pastor who's trying to lead his sheep needs a good sheepdog. And he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 some men that can protect the pastor, protect the flock and, uh, and stand up. And look, we need that. Look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, I'm only sharing this one to show kind of Elisha's attitude and the protective nature he has of, his, uh, of, of Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 2. I've always thought the way that this is worded is pretty interesting. 2 Kings 2, look at verse 3. It says, And the sons of the prophets... All right, now these are all like the preacher boys, those, those guys who are, uh, you know, God talks to the prophets, but it seems like they're all kind of studying and training and waiting to be uh, in a used by God in a various position. And it says uh, that we're in Bethel, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? Somehow they got the word. They got the revelation, right, that Elijah's going up. And they, he said, Yay, I know it. Hold your peace. <laughs> you know, I, I just think right, an interesting his attitude was just like, you know, will you shut up about it? You know, just hold your peace. All right. I already know. And he says it again in uh I don't remember where. There's another another verse where he says the same thing. Uh as you verse verse five, he said, Yeah, verse five, he says it again. The sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou uh that the Lord will take away that master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. <laughs> you know. And it just seems like he had this strong attachment with his master. And they're, they even recognize that because they're like, you know, your master is going to be removed from your head. And, and he's like, I know it. I know it. And so, I don't know. There's just this attitude that he has a sense of loyalty. You know what I mean? Uh, now, I've often had this statement because I think about loyalty as important, super important. Loyalty to your family, loyalty to your church, loyalty to uh, to uh, your pastor, loyalty. All these things are important, but I've always had this phrase, like I'm loyal, but not mafia loyal. <laughs> okay, do you know what I mean by that? In the mafia, it's like they will do any wicked thing. It doesn't matter. Uh, I've been watching this. Uh, man, I've been. it's really strange how the Lord works in different things, but I've been doing a lot of uh, like criminal psychology and studying behavioral science and stuff. And, and, uh, and so in, in, while I'm studying these things and I'm preaching on that, uh, uh, let's see, Wednesday I'm preaching on narcissistic, uh, uh, let's see, what's it called? Narcissistic, uh, 
whatever. It's a it's a it's a problem. <laughs> behavioral behavioral. Uh, you know, some people have that personality uh, disorder, and uh, and so uh, and then I just recently talked about. Um, well, that's kind of different, but it's called uh, imposter. Uh, syndrome, and uh, anyway, so I'm studying these behavioral traits and like com- and using it in, in, in from a biblical standpoint, and uh, and I was so I was watching these different like uh, court cases, you know, and these uh, true true crime like things that actually happen, and I'm telling you, man, you can only watch so much of that before you realize there's just a wickedness in this world that you just want to believe doesn't exist, but it does, and uh, and one thing I found is interesting, like in two different cases. Okay, in one case, there was this lady, this, this girl, who convinced her boyfriend, he's kind of had a mental handicap, but it convinced her to kill her mom. And this guy said, I would never do this for anyone, but I love her, I worship her, I would do anything she asked me to do. And so she was able to convince him, because of his loyalty to her, to kill somebody, and particularly her mom. Crazy, crazy. Another case... This guy uh, had a girlfriend whose mom didn't want him to them to be seeing each other. I wonder why he was she was 15 and he was like 24 or something like that. And uh, and this guy had a friend who was super loyal. Said I would do anything for my friend. And that friend said, Okay, I want you to kill my girlfriend's mom. Went and killed her mom. And I'm thinking, what kind of a loyalty? I mean, how can you imagine? But and this is kind of how the mafia is. It's just like these people are so. Uh, it's like, you know, uh, uh, what do they say? I got, blood is thicker than water, but that's not the right one I'm using. But th- these guys, basically, they're just, their bond is so, you know, stronger than even that of just a regular family, whatever, that they would do anything for each other. They will cover for each other. They'll never tell on the other person. In fact, partly is because if you tell on the other person in prison, they will kill you for it. <laughs> okay, so they don't tell on each other. They have a sense of loyalty. If, they're, if they go to prison and they're part of a mafia or whatever, and the mafia boss is going to sit down at the table and somebody else sits in that mafia boss's uh, uh, spot, he'll tell somebody, hey, kill him. And he'll, and he'll go to jail the rest of his life. And he'll stay in prison the rest of his life because he'll murder that guy just because his boss told him to do that. Look, <clears throat> when it comes to being loyal to a man of God, you know, when it comes to being loyal to your pastor, to your church, Always realize this, your loyalty to God needs to be stronger. Like if, the, if your pastor tells you to do something and it goes against the Bible, like go with the Bible. <laughs> if there's a way to do it, you know, talk to your pastor, tell him what the Bible says. But always your loyalty needs to be to God, not, to, uh, not just to, um, uh, to the man of God. However, it is important that we have people who are loyal to us and people who will defend us and people who stick up for us. And, uh, and, uh, and all these things are super important. And I feel like Elisha was that kind of man uh, would have protected and watched out and took care t- uh, and taken care of uh, Elijah. All right, finally, ver- uh, number four. Someone, and this is the key here, someone to train to take over, you know, whenever he's gone. Okay. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. There's that loyalty again. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets... Uh, that were at Bethel, came forth to Elijah. Uh, We already read this. He said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Verse 4, Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee. And the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophet said what they said again. Verse 6, And Elijah said unto them, Tarry to him, tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood in view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that they, went, uh, they too went over dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee. Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. 
And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So it's this worked out this thing where it's like, hey, you know what? If you see me go up in the whirlwind, then you'll get a double portion of my spirit. I'm not sure why that was a stipulation, but it was. But imagine asking for a double portion. Now, there is some significance here. When somebody passed on in an inheritance when they died, the, the Old Testament way was the firstborn got a double portion of the inheritance, okay? And then everything else was divided up after that to the rest of the people. So there is some spiritual significance there. I mean, some sign cultural significance there. But it appears to me like what he's saying is, you know what? I want that spirit that God gave you. Like, I want a double portion of that. Like, just, just give me, I just want to be like you and even more so, right? Now, I'll tell you this. As a pastor, as a leader, I want for this church and for Iola and for, over anything I do, I want the next person after me to be way better than I am. <laughs> I want them to have way more like intelligence, way more skills, speaking skills. I want them to have way more than I And that should be the case for everybody. I want my kids when I'm dead and gone to be able to do better things than I did and accomplish more and be and, and, and be wiser and all those kinds of things. That should be our goal to, to pass on. But here's a man that says, you know, I've been pouring water on your hands. I've been ministering to you. I've been loyal to you. I've followed you around. I've done what you've asked me to do. I've proven myself to be faithful and, 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 and to get accomplished what you have me to, be, to accomplish. And now in your absence, here's the one thing I want that bond that you had with the Lord and that ability to hear from the Lord and to do great things for the Lord. I want to be able to do that and more. And Elijah said, that's a hard thing that you're asking. Because if you remember Elijah, sure, he called down rain from, from heaven and called down, you know, fire from heaven upon the altar. And, and he had an ability to do some mighty things with the Lord by the power of the Lord. But guess what he also had? He had Jezebel hunting him down, trying to kill him. He had, you know, people that hated his guts. He, he was hated by the king. He was not popular. He's hiding out in caves and he's, and he's going underground and all this kind of stuff. And so he's like, you know, you want a double portion of my spirit? Well, you better be ready because it's going to come with that. You're going to have all the persecution and, and, and all the hard work and the things that trials that are involved in that. But at the end of the day, if that's what God wants for you, and it's the best thing uh, that you could possibly do. So he takes up the uh, mantle uh, in 2 Kings 2, verse 12. Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he went back, and he stood by the bank of Jordan and he took the mantle of Elijah and it fell from him and smote the waters and said, I'm sorry, that fell from him and he smote the waters and said, what it, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also uh, smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over. So you see he's doing the same miracle that Elijah did earlier. Now it's been said, and I don't know, I didn't do the math. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it's been said that if you count up all the miracles that Elijah did, and you count up all the miracles that Elisha did, that it's exactly twice as many that Elisha does than what Elijah did. I don't know if that's significant. He did say, I want a double portion of your spirit. But the idea is simply, Elijah needed this man to, you know, not only be somebody who could minister to him, not only be somebody who could complete the jobs that he, you know, wasn't able to get completed, not only someone who was able to defend and protect him, but then finally somebody that he was able to train up and he was able to confidently, confidently pass that on before he left. And, uh, and he was, uh, we would use the phrase today, passing the torch, you know, to carry on in, uh, in the person's absence. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you uh, for your word and thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord, that you have raised up. Uh, as you did say, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lord, certainly you have been building this church and uh, I pray that you'll continue to do so, that you'll bring 
uh, men and women who would be a, uh, a help to minister and to uh, fulfill things and uh, be loyal and do things that uh, I or other men in the church wouldn't be able to get done on our own. Uh, help us all to work together, particularly, Lord, when it comes to uh, knocking doors and winning souls. Lord, help us all work together for that goal. That's our priority. And, uh, and I pray that you would bless even the work day coming up and all these areas where we can uh, help one another. And we do it not for our own glory, not for our own uh, uh, advancement, but we do it for the kingdom of God and for your honor and glory. So I pray you help us do that now in Jesus' name. Amen.